You are muted. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the event put together by Global Leadership Impact Summit. Global Leadership Impact Summit will be on July the 22nd with a projected attendance of about 5,000 Toastmasters all over the globe. This is an, an event today leading up to the final event on July the 22nd. Today we have Firsi Gotuako on how to speak with confidence, credibility, and conviction. Before I go into the workshop, however, if you can put in the chat where you are from, what city you are from, uh, that'd be great. So we can know where you are from, coming from. Uh, and, and while you're doing that also, what I like to do is uh, tell you a little bit more about the workshop and what we are doing here today. My idea is that in Toastmasters, we learn a lot of things and we, learn how to speak, we need. We learn how to sort of do use of our gestures and how to look at the camera and all those sort of things and be on the stage if you are in a, a physical meeting. But how do you take that concept out into the world and what does it really look like? If you, if you look at uh, professional speakers and even CEOs who are very good at speaking, like Steve Jobs and so on, their method of... Uh, doing things was very, very different than what you might be doing in a Toastmasters club, especially nowadays with storytelling and all that, you know, sometimes people get a bit too dramatic. So what's, what does it really look like in, a, in the real life? And that is what we are really going to look at today. So now let's look at the chat and see what's really going on. I see people from all over the world here coming. Uh, we have uh, some, somebody from Arabia, Hermosillo, UAE, Egypt, Hyderabad, and, and so on. Trinidad, Netherlands, Oakville. Oh, Oakville, my local, uh, just two, <laughs> two minutes from where I am. Belleville, Malaysia, Singapore, and so on and so forth. And, and of course, Mary Lou is from uh, Brunswick County Toastmasters Club, North Carolina, India, Switzerland, and so on and so forth. Wow. We've got people from all over the world. So thank you so much for attending today. Uh, as uh, as you can see, the, the people are still coming in. So we will uh, keep introducing ourselves and uh, wh why we are here now. Tell me in the chat what club you are from. If you're a Toastmaster, what club are you from in the chat? And let me see uh, the clubs that you're from. So that, that gives us right a couple of more minutes for the people who are just pouring in right now. And uh, Hannah, who is our uh, moderator today, is like scrambling very, very hard to sort of let people in. So <laughs> there's a huge list of people just coming in and as you can see from the numbers in the participants where uh, that the numbers are rapidly rising as well now let's see somebody's from smedley's chapter one dubai legends mumbai communicators cairo toastmasters uh sagina harvey spalding lobova to oh wow lobova hi baron how are you on the moment okay that's very good it's, i think that's in uh not far, far from here pretoria south africa oh okay that's the city I, ITMA, Belleville, Speak Easy. That should be Sandra, I believe. No, Susan Pomfret. Okay. Uh, Sweda Kumari from Chennai. Uh, Rima Toastmasters, Jambar. New, oh, somebody's from New Zealand. Anthony Fletcher from New Zealand. Wow. What time is it in New Zealand? Just put that in the chat. Somebody's from Johor Bahru. Arar Toastmasters Club, 9546 Caribbean. Amazing, amazing. So all sorts of clubs, all sorts of Toastmasters everywhere around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> welcome to Global Leadership Impact Summit's uh, event that we are putting together today. And uh, if I can get the right background, my one of my moderators isn't here today uh, because it's a Sunday. So there you go. That's um, the background I should really be having. I would now like to welcome, of course, Farsi Godwak, who is like getting ready to tell you all about what is known as the world champion of public speaking finalist, as well as, of course, three-time Toastmaster district champion winning both in China and the, and in the United States. He's an executive speech coach and combines his experience as a theater teacher at for 30 years with his success of being a finalist, which I've already said, at the world champion of public speaking and synthesizes everything he's learned through the lens of leadership and the way he's uh, refined everything that he, that he knows, even as a principal in a school, he's a principal in China. 
He has helped actors and speakers in New York, Los Angeles, and Shanghai. And now he is ready to help you take your skills to the new level. Now, he's, he lives in China, but you will hear, if you have never heard of Percy or heard him speak, he speaks with a perfect North American accent. Why? Because he's lived in Texas and he wasn't even born in China, but he lives in China. Perhaps he might tell us a little bit more. But ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome my dear friend and a member of Leadership Speak, Farsi Gotuako. Farsi, welcome to the meeting and your workshop. We're all looking forward to it. Hello, Brahm. Oh, okay, I am unmuted. Hello, Brahm, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the meeting. We are going to go fast. We got a limited amount of time, right, Brahm? So we are going to rock yes. this thing moving forward. Ask your questions, put them in the chat or put a hand up. I'll take them as we go. This is going to be interactive. Go ahead and open your cameras and we're going to be doing some things because the best way to learn is by doing. The absolute best way to learn is by doing. And that way, if you've got a question, you can ask it immediately and get immediate response. Let's get answers for you so that you can move forward with the journey that you really want to take. Here's the first thing that we're going to do. Let's get warmed up. If you really want to be in front of an audience, if you really want to have everything focused, amplifying your presence, then you have to warm it up like a world-class athlete. Actually, any kind of athlete, even those of you who go running, jogging, do gymnastics on your own, play tennis, play some mm -hmm. soccer, you got to warm up. You have to warm up or you're going to pull something. I just came from a mountain hike. I didn't warm up. I think I pulled something. It happens. So let's get warmed up first. The first thing we need to do is understand that our head has to move. So if you would, go ahead and roll your head one way. Good. And the other way. Fantastic. Realize that our heads are incredibly important to be able to communicate with people. Whether you're talking about being on a Zoom call or being live on a stage, this is what the audience is focused on. This is what the audience is looking at. So we've got to make sure that this instrument is ready. And I'm going to come back to us to exactly why it needs to be there for your voice. But first, the physicality. What do people see? What do people see? Next. I know we're going to get a little strange because you don't usually see people warm up, do you? You watch a soccer game, you watch a tennis match, you don't see them warming up for an hour beforehand. If you did, you'd be like, you really do that? You really do that before the game? Yes. Do you really do that before you speak, Fuzzy? Yes, I do. So here's what I'm going to have you do. I need you to make a big face. What I mean by that is this. Make your face as big as you can. <laughs> Galal, I see you, buddy. Way to go. Here we go. One, two, three. Big face. Little face. Big face. Little face. Very good. You have just immediately stretched out your face and you realize that you have muscles there. And now, just for these guys right here, these little eyebrows right here. Here we go, Sandra. Ready? Eyebrows up. Eyebrows down. Eyebrows up. Eyebrows down. And now for you truly talented people, one eyebrow up. And then down. Good job, Tom. Now the other one up. There you go, Marie. And then down. These are facial expressions, especially on Zoom. One eyebrow can make all the difference in the world. It's that same eyebrow, Henry, that when your kid comes to you and says, oh, no, really, the dog ate my homework. Really? <laughs> One eyebrow does it all. Look at that. Look at, look at, look at what Henry's doing. He's like, really? 
there are so many ways that we can use eye contact to engage our audience. Not just this, but the head tilt, because we just moved our heads, right? So we proved, we proved, McKinley, that our heads can actually move, right? Isn't that right, Sweeta? Our heads can move and our eyebrows can move with them. Is this really the way we want to treat our customers? Yeah, there are so many different things that we can do with our head, our eyebrows, our eyes, smile. And so you can warm all of those up ahead of time. Great, here's the next thing I'd like for you to do. I'd like you to take your shoulders and rotate them back. You wanna loosen them up, good. And now forward. Part of it is you want to isolate your different parts of your body. Good. Now one forward, one back. I say that like it's easy, but most of you are about to smack your computer off the table trying to get this right. And then others of you are going to learn how to do this just to teach it to your grandkids. Now reverse it. The other one forward, the other one back. So part of it is isolation to understand that there are different parts of your body and they all work independently. I know. They all work independently. Good. Now do this for me. Both shoulders up and hold it. Up. One, two, three, and down. Good. Up. One, two, three, and down. Very good. You'll notice that Brom Mamon was very good at that one. That's because he learned that in math class. They would go, Brom, what's the answer? And he'd go, I don't know. So, <laughs> Now that I've just been finished abusing our host. <laughs> so isolations, that's important. Being able to isolate the different parts of our body. But the other aspect of this, our shoulders hold so much tension. And when our shoulders hold that tension, it restricts our ability to speak properly. We're gonna cover voice a little later, but just so you understand where this is all connected, the physicality that we use must relax us to the point where we can speak with a full voice because that's what lends confidence. We lend it to the audience, our voice. Because it's really hard to trust a voice that sounds like it's tight and squeezed. Does that make sense? So when we speak, we want to speak with the full resonance that you were born with. All right, next thing. If you're not standing, you may want to stand for this. Stand and rotate just your upper torso. Now, I can't see your hips, but I'm just going to take it on faith that you are keeping your hips in place. Very good, Sweeta. Excellent. There you go. Just your upper torso. Some of you connected by headset, you're probably strangling yourself with your headset right now. I apologize. Very good. Now rotate your upper and your lower torso. That means you're twisting all the way down to your ankles. And there's a difference. There's a difference. Good. Now, for you truly talented people, your hips one way and your shoulders the other. You can't see my hips, but they're going in an opposite direction. If you've ever watched your watched your washing machine for your clothing you know it's got that little thing going i forgot what it's called who knows what that called Galal, you know what that's called you know what i mean it's it's moving the clothing around in different directions right spin cycle that, well yeah well no spin cycle the whole thing's moving right but the little guy in the middle he twists in different directions twist cycle excuse me twist cycle okay <laughs> exactly exactly agitator that. agitator that's the same name I came up for my sister. Okay, no, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Mary Lou, I think you enjoyed that one just a little too much. Okay, so here's the thing. When we are moving 
in front of an audience. We have to realize that if we stay in this picture for too long and we move as one solid piece, it gets a little boring to watch. And our bodies can do a whole lot more than that. Imagine when you're doing PowerPoints. The PowerPoint is behind you, but your audience is in front of you. So what direction are you going? You can go in both. And your body is twisting and your head is going a third direction. So I've got my hand going here at the PowerPoint. I've got my left hand going over here towards my audience and my head is swiveling making eye contact. My body is going in different directions and it can. I don't have to move as one solid block because that's not anywhere near as good to look at as this. I'm speaking of you, of course. So let the audience keep the eye contact with you. That's important. We know that. It's not just a checkoff list on the TI generic evaluation form. It's critical. The eye contact is critical to keep engagement with the people. And so is your hand moving out towards your audience, conducting their eyes towards you. That's the use of these. We're not using these just for the sake of moving our hands because we have to have gesture. We are using them to conduct the attention of the audience. If you're on this screen, then the movements are a little smaller. We'll come to that in a moment. But if you're on a stage, then you can make that adjustment. So we twist, not all the time, but when we need to. We twist when we need to. I'm gonna give you all of these, and these are all part of your toolbox. It doesn't mean that you have to be some kind of spinning top on stage. That's not the point. The point is, when you need it, you know how to find it. You don't use every single tool in your toolbox on every single project. Sometimes you use the drill, sometimes you use the hammer, and sometimes all you need is a little bit of duct tape. When you're cooking, you've got all those great spices and ingredients. You don't use them all at the same time, or it's gonna taste awful. You use the spices selectively. Same thing with all of these tools. You're not going to use them all at the same time, but you select, which tool do I need? Do I need this tool where I use my whole arm? Or do I use this tool? Now, let's go back to the arm, shall we? What direction was my arm pointing? What direction is my arm pointing? Give it a shot, Hannah. What direction is my arm pointing? Thank you, Brom. Good. Oh, AJ, upstage, getting tactical. Mm. Yes, Brom, backwards is correct, and AJ is technically, theatrically correct. Upstage is away from the audience. So I can point backwards. Has anybody ever thought about that? That you could have a gesture that points behind you. So many times when we gesture, Everything's right here in this box, between the shoulder blades even. But remember when I was having you move your shoulders backwards? It's because sometimes our hands can move backwards. Why would they need to go backwards? Well, the easy answer is PowerPoint, isn't it? You're pointing at your screen. You're pointing at your PowerPoint and keeping your presence moving forward. But you can also talk about your past your present, your future, your past. This was behind me, figuratively, literally. My old habits are behind me. 
What we used to do in 1980s is behind us. The way we treated our employees is behind us. We are now going to move forward. We can use our hands to echo what we're saying and magnify what we're saying. We are amplifying our presence. We use our gestures to create a greater impact on our space. If this is your space, then use your gestures within this space. If this is your space, then use your gestures to impact that space. You decide the scale of your gestures. I would encourage you to next consider your elbows. We've talked about the shoulders and now we go to the elbows. Most times when people speak, they got this thing going on. I'm speaking. I am speaking. And this is so important to me that I'm doing this. What is this? What is that? What is that? What is this? More soup, please. No, what is this, Susan? What does this look like to us, right? If, if Sandra, when you see somebody on stage and this is the best they got, what are they really communicating? Maybe they're praying. Maybe. Maybe. But they're praying because they don't think that they have any other empowered action. So this is the prayer they've got. Nothing wrong with prayer. I pray, but it communicates a lack of control. It communicates pizza, pizza for everyone. <laughs> I call it forklift. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. I am now going to serve you the message. I have taken it off chat GPT, and here it is for you. We can do better. We can do better than that. Our hands are these incredible instruments. And just look at Tom. He's like, oh my gosh, this guy is over the top and he needs a new haircut. Our hands can do so much, Hannah. This is probably something that you came up with the first time. Now what? Because if we do this for our whole speech, our audience is going to tune us out. Our audiences have very short attention span. Sorry, I just saw some shiny object. Our audiences have very short attention. There it goes again. Did you see that? Our audiences have very short attention spans. Some of you right now on your phones. You got your phone and you hold it right here. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Looks like I'm watching the screen, but really it's your cell phone up against the screen. Remember, I teach students all day long. I know what they're doing behind the screen. So our hands can do more than this. And that includes pointing backwards. As I said, the movement starts with the shoulder. And that means that the movement between the shoulder and the hand must go through the elbow we move the elbows away from the body. So it's not here, but it's out here. All of a sudden we've created a presence. You don't think this looks more confident than this? You see what I'm talking about? And all you had to do, all you had to do was move your elbows away from your torso. And all of a sudden your presence is increased and amplified. Now, I have presence because I'm controlling the space. Also consider this area here as negative space. I know most of you are thinking, well, first, you know, that little space between your ears, that's kind of negative space too. Actually, that's what my older brother used to tell me. But here's the thing. This is negative space. This is positive space. You see my hands, but because my body is here, you don't see the silhouette of it. 
So you see part of it, but watch what happens when I move my hands out into negative space. You see so much more. This now stands out against the black background. This is gonna change with what background you have. Something to concern yourself with, but what's the lighting like in your space? Because a lot of people nowadays will have a LED screen or a projection screen, and it is lit up like Broadway. So therefore you have to tell the people in charge of the space, would you turn on more light on my face and dim the screen? They can do that sometimes. Does that make sense, Vivian? Make this brighter because that is your money maker. So make sure that they see your face. Make sure that the audience understands this is how you're going to communicate and that you need it visible against that background. So move your gestures out into negative space, off to the side. Look where my shoulders are and look where my hands are. The relationship, they're not here, they're here. Again, pivot of the body, pivot of the body, very simply moving it into negative space. You can pivot at the hips, you can pivot with your feet, left side, right side. I'm not asking to go out there and be a mimist. You don't have to do that, but it is the idea that I can use my hands to emphasize my point. We all know we need to have a point. My mother used to say the point was on the top of my head. As you can tell, I got beat up a lot by my family members. That's what happens when you're number six of seven. You get beat up a lot and you get a lot of old clothing too. Especially my sisters, that just wasn't fun. Okay, so here's the thing. You can, Sandra's like, yes, I'm gonna use that. No, you can. You can use your hands to emphasize your point. We all have a point. We usually say it in the introduction and then you have it in your body and then you have it in your conclusion. Sometimes in the body, you might say it two or three times. When you do, you can use your hands to echo your point, to emphasize your point. Whatever your point is, use the same gesture. Use the same gesture. Use the same gesture. Use the same gesture. Every time you say it, Use the same gesture. You can even make it subtle. The first time you do it, there it is. The second time you do it, it's there. The third time you do it, it's there. And then in your conclusion, it's there. You are emphasizing the point to your audience. We're an incredibly visual society. We are. We're going to go see a play. We're going to go see a movie. A couple hundred years ago, we're gonna go hear play. They would hear. Today we see. So what the audience sees is going to create a visual image that impacts them. They can't hear and listen to everything we say. So we have to give them something visual, a cue that reminds them of what you're trying to say. When you're live and on stage and you want to create that presence, you can do this, you can move around, and you can pivot. You don't want to just give them this picture, not when you can stand even at one angle here. That's all I did is just pivot my shoulders. When you're on screen, think about direction and duration. Direction and duration. Does that make sense, Fabiola? Direction and duration. Direction is what direction is my hand going? Now, I'm not just saying go right, go left, but consider this. There are three planes that our eyes subliminally see. Three planes, P-L-A-N-E-S. Like geometric planes. Subliminally, we see this one. It divides left 
from right. Make sense? Left and right. And then there's this plane. It divides front from back. Yes, ma'am, that's exactly it. And then there's this one, which divides top from bottom. If our gestures stay within the same plane, it's nowhere near as impactful as if they were to cross a plane. When they cross a plane, subliminally, it forces the audience's mind to think just a little bit more. And when they're thinking a little bit more, I mean, we're talking split seconds, it's not conscious. It keeps them more interested. It's a challenge because the hand is going across. I'm moving from one side of my body to the other. I'm moving from one side of the screen to the other. I'm moving from one side of the stage of the room, the boardroom of the meeting room to the other. And that is far more dynamic than here. It's crossing this plane. Now, if you want to challenge your audience even more, cross two planes at the same time. For example, there's this plane and this plane. So if my hand does that, I'm crossing on a diagonal. And that is far more impactful. It's subtle. It's subtle. I'm not asking you to go up to your boardroom and go, whoa. But you can say, our company is trending up. One hard was it? We are trending up. Rather than going, we're trending up. See the difference? We're trending up. We are trending up. Being able to control your hands so that they do everything that you want them to do. We've talked about direction. What was the second thing I said to discuss about movement? Direction and duration. Duration. Yes. Thank you, Aisha. How long is he going to keep his hand there until I get done karate chopping my audience? How many times have people done gestures where they look like they're karate chopping people? My gosh, it looks like a Ginsu knife at, doesn't it? Who remembers those? Was, any, was anybody else? around when except for me watching ginsu knife ads right right mckinley right now i'm going to chop up a beer can then i'm going to chop up a tomato just to show how good my finger is all right now duration when people gesture they tend to gesture simply up down i make my point and then it drops sometimes it drops all the way down to my pocket my thigh i make my point and then it drops i make my point and then it drops i make my point and... well now the audience is on to you audience is on to you that means in the back of their mind they're going to go to sleep once the audience is on to you they're going to go to sleep same thing as when you go see a movie when you know the end of a movie you're like not enough popcorn in the world to keep you awake so we have to keep the audience thinking in the back of their brain would everyone please raise their right or left hand. I would just say right hand, but I don't want you to feel like we're in a court of law or anything. Right or left, totally up. Oh, she's got two, Sandra's got two. Woo, woo. Good job, good job, Sandra. Now, what I want you to do is to lower your hand in five seconds, no more, no less. I will count it out for us, ready? Go, five, four, three, two, one. It's that easy. And yet, how many speakers have you ever seen not do that? They just sort of go, uh, uh. who's ever done this? Okay, good. No, who's ever done this? Keep it up there, right? So now watch, take your same hand and you're gonna move it across the screen, okay? But this time, this time, 30 seconds. I know it's gonna feel almost painful, like going to the dentist. You know you're not gonna die, but it sort of feels that way. Here we go, 30 seconds, ready? Go, 30. 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 
22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's about as interesting as watching an apple core turn brown, isn't it? Would we ever actually do that on, uh, in a presentation? Probably not. But you might do five seconds. You might do 10 seconds. You might do 15 seconds. You might talk about the time that something important happened to you and how you watched that company that you sold slowly fade away out of your reach. And you've decided I'm never gonna let that happen to my company again. One image, powerful. One image. And all it took was for you to manipulate the duration, direction, and duration of our gestures. Our hands, our hands come in many different shapes. Go ahead and put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up. All right, our hands can be many ways, flat. Everybody can do flat. Watch this, it's the back of our hands. We might do that sometimes. Good, now do this for me. Round shape, fist. Keep the fist in one, point at it with the other. Our hands can be asymmetrical. Thank you. Our hands can be asymmetrical. Watch any speaker and you'll find that most of the time they tend to gesture symmetrically. They tend to gesture symmetrically, but our hands can be asymmetrical. Now, Sandra, I know you're thinking already, oh, you know, Fursi, this is like that whole thing where you rub your head and you pat your belly or you pat your head and you rub your... Yeah. Body going in two different directions. Remember what I had you do with your shoulders? You can do that with your hands too. Two different directions at the same time. It's the idea that our hands can move independently, yes? Our hands can move independently and you can use one hand to gesture to the other. There are so many abstract things that we talk about. When you give a presentation, you've got a lot of abstract things to talk about. How do you make them concrete? Yes, you can put it on a PowerPoint. Yes, you can have a slideshow. But wouldn't it be nice if once in a while you could even use your hands to discuss it and even point to it? We have to take our people, all of our employees, and surround them and protect them, or whatever it is you're saying. We're gonna take our kids and we're gonna protect them. We can use our hands to do that. It creates a sense of reality for them that is even better than a PowerPoint. When we talk about a sense of credibility, there's the data that you have in your presentations, but there's also the use of our hands to be able to make something look real to them. And when it's real in our hands, then it starts to become real in their minds. We can be strong with our gestures and have conviction with our gestures by thinking about the tension in our hands. This is another weird thing to talk about. And some of you will get it and some of you won't. But watch the tension in my hand. This is one thing. This is another, the tension. We can create tension in our hands and that tension creates an intensity. And so we don't just gesture, but we gesture. We are going to the moon. We are gonna take this company forward. There's a tension in my hand. It's not an anger. It's attention. 
where we hold our hands even up here or when I held my hand here or when I held my arm there, there's a tension to it and that's a presence from my body and I'm transferring that energy to my audience. That's really what we're doing when we're presenting, isn't it? We are transferring our energy to our audience. For some, that's like hocus pocus. I don't know what kind of mumbo jumbo you're talking about, Fursey. It stems from my theater background. But as performers, we are, cre we are moving our presence forward. We are coming with all our energy and we're transferring that to the audience. Same thing when we are speaking. We are transferring our energy to our audience. We're getting them excited. We're persuading them. We're persuading them and making our point. And the more we speak with conviction, the more we use our hands with conviction, the more our point seems credible. Imagine if somebody said this, I think we ought to go to the moon. Yeah, this company is going to do big things, big things. No, I don't think so. We're going to do big things. Yep. We're going to do big things. So big, it goes out of the screen. Come back here. We can use our hands. We can change the shape of our hands to create what we need to create and create the presence that we want with our audience. Next is our voice. Let's use our voice the way it was intended to be. First, would you do me a quick favor? Would you inhale on a two count? One, two, ready? Inhale and relax. Inhale and relax. Now this time when you inhale, I want you to be very aware of your shoulders. Make sure not to lift your shoulders and instead inhale into your belly. Ready? Go. Inhale. Exhale. Your shoulders should not rise. Your shoulders shouldn't rise. You should be inhaling into your diaphragm, which is sucking air down into your lungs and then pushing it out. The reason why that's important, and we could spend years talking about this. I know this because I took a voice classes. <laughs> It's years. We could spend years talking about the diaphragm, but suffice it to say, the diaphragm is how we pull air in and push air out. That's the power of your voice. But most of us don't do that. Most of us use our chest voice. And when we get really stressed out, we use our throat. And that's how we get sore throats when we're speaking. Not because we're speaking a lot. It's because we're using the wrong part of our body to speak. Yes, the vibration is created by our vocal cords, but the power pushing the air up has to come from our diaphragm. When it doesn't come from the diaphragm, it gets stressed out and it sounds stressed out like right now. It's stressed out. There's tension. And most of us carry tension, even if you are chilled out and relaxed. I know, Brahma is always kind of chilled out and relaxed until Fursey shows up 30 seconds before he's supposed to. But, <clears throat> sorry about that, Brahma. But when we speak with the voice that we were all given, it's not just me with this voice, by the way. I know a lot of people go, Fursey, you really got a, you got a voice, man. Like you could be on radio. And, and that's what they used to say, Sandra. My, my, my uh, teachers used to say, Fursey, you got a, you got a face for radio, man. <clears throat> okay, so we were all given the tool of strong voice. How many of you have ever heard a child crying in a large space? <clears throat> yeah. There you go, Martin. Yeah, McKinley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crowded restaurant. Disney World, oh my gosh, they're crying and they're so loud. And so, Jyothi, I wonder, how does such a small package create so much noise and so much poop? We all were born with the ability to power up a voice. 
When we cry, it's loud, it's designed that way. We all have these big voices. So when we're young, hey, we got a voice. And then people told us, use your inside voice. And then they said, oh, you need to shush because grandma's trying to sleep. And then the teacher told you to shush because she's trying to control 20, 30 kids in the class. And then you're kind of scared you're going to get the answer wrong. So you go ahead and just start talking like this from here on out. And Fursy goes, Fursy goes, what's your name? And you go, Henry. I'm like, Henry, was that an answer or a question? Because I'm just asking you what your name is. But if you ask the kids that, they go, oh, no. And they're filled with so much doubt. They're filled with so much doubt. We as adults have so much tension because we think we're going to be wrong. And we're scared. And so we start to learn how to speak. And then we join Toastmasters and we go to Toastmasters and we attend Leadership Speaks. And then we understand from Fursey's workshop that this is the voice we were really built with. It comes from relaxing. That's why I had you guys do that earlier. It comes from relaxing our shoulders, relaxing our chest muscles, relaxing our voice. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, tomorrow morning when you wake up, first thing you do, first thing you do before you grab your phone, Martin. Okay, Mary Lou, I know what you're doing. You're, the first thing you wake up, you're grabbing your phone. Hey, what's going on on the Facebook? Now, the first thing you do before you grab your phone, breathe out. Oh, just like that. Oh. I know, then your husband and wife's going, what are you doing? What are you calling for the mothership? What are you doing? So, ah, uh, and the first thing in the morning when you wake up, that's when your voice is most connected. You're connected to your diaphragm. Your body hasn't had a chance to get stressed out yet. You just woke up. There's no stress. That's your voice. The challenge is... How do you get up out of bed and move on with life and still retain that connection? It'll take a little while, but it does have to be a very conscious effort. So when we speak and when we do warm-ups for speaking, it requires vocals. So I'd like for you, I know, more strange stuff from Fursey. You're never going to trust Brahm Mamone again because he's like, keep bringing Fursey up here. What I want you to do is to blow through your lips like this. The guys can do it because we love doing that sound. <laughs> the girls are like, eh, it's going to mess up my lipstick. Okay, try it again. Good, that loosens up your lips. This is one of the number one things we have to use to make sure that our sound is clear. Next thing I want you to do, move your tongue around the inside of your mouth. Rub it up against your teeth. You're like, what? Yeah, just rub it up against your teeth. Sandra, just remember, this does not replace flossing. You still got to do that. Good. Because you have to warm up your tongue. You have to warm up your tongue to get it ready to speak. I'd like for you to do a tongue twister with me. It's not really a tongue twister, but it is a phrase you can use. Repeat after me. Today I will speak. I didn't hear a single one of you. Oh, sorry, your mute is on. Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> I'll see if you ready. Okay, here we go. Today I will speak. Today I will speak. Yes. Second part with a rich, round. Good. Repeat that again with a rich, round. With a rich round resonant voice, resonant voice, excellent. One more time, please. Resonant voice, resonant voice. All right, let's put it all together. Today, I will speak. Today, I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. With a rich, round, resonant voice. All together. 
Today, I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. Today, I will speak with a rich, resonant, round voice. Good. Make sure to hit the D on round, round, right? And make sure to make the S in resonant sound like a Z. Resonant, resonant. And then make sure to hit the T on resonant, all right? Resonant. Resonant. And then make sure that today I will speak, speak. Make sure that the E sound is coming out the front of the mouth, right at the top of the teeth. Speak, speak. It's very laser like. Speak. And then the K on speak. Speak, speak. Today I will speak with a rich, 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 rich. The sound is up. Rich, rich, round. Nice full sound, round, resonant voice. That's a lot to think about. Furzy, whoa, give us time. Wow, I only got an hour and 20 minutes. But you see where you got to do that, right? You see where you have to look at all those letters to make sure that we are clear. Here we go. All together. I'll say it first, just to remind you, all right? Here we go. Res Today, I will speak with a voice. rich, round, resonant round voice. Go ahead. Voice. Today, I will speak with a round, resonant voice. Good. That was great, but it's rich, round, resonant voice. Oh, rich, round. round, resonant voice. So this is what you want to rehearse before you go and speak. You can do it out in the hallway before you enter your meeting room. You can do it at home before you go there. On your way, on your way to your speaking site, would you do this for me, please? Mm, want you to hum. Mm, It's that simple. We're not going to do it for a long period of time tonight because we just don't have time. But I normally do that for about two hours. <laughs> I just saw Martin go, what? Dude, you need to get a life. You're driving. You're taking a shower. You're getting dressed. You're packing your kids' lunch. Humming. Hum a song if you want. I start out with basic tones and then go up and down the scale with different notes on a song. You're warming up your vocal cords. You're warming up your vocal cords. And you're having fun because you're probably humming the favorite song that you have in your head. Here we go to the hardest part of the whole evening. Everything has been very easy. Until question, question before you go on, Percy. Question. Yes. Is it a short humming or till the air is out of your lungs? As if say you can do both. You can do both. If the air is out of your lungs, then what you're really doing is you're trying to catch your breath. You're trying to force yourself to breathe in. It can be short humming. <laughs> okay. It can be a short. That's a great question. Thank you. And, oh, and the backwards. other question is, two hours before your speech or every day? You can do every day, but definitely on the days that you speak, two hours. Great but, questions. Thank you, Brian. Do we have to be hummingbirds? Are we hummingbirds? Absolutely. It helps get the house cleaner faster. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Joffy it. knows. All right. Those are great questions. Thank you, Brom. Here's the hardest one. What in the world does this mean? The key to finding our voice. We say a lot of things when we speak. We've got a lot of words. How in the world are we supposed to make sure that everybody gets our message? Because if we try to emphasize every word, it's going to sound strange. And that's why you have to find the key. A key to your door is the key that unlocks your door. Yes, I know, don't mean to be pedantic, but it unlocks 
the door. It opens the door. The key word unlocks the meaning. The key word unlocks the meaning. You think the audience knows exactly what you're trying to say? I can't even get my mother to understand exactly what I'm trying to say. You think an audience of 100, 500 can understand what you're trying to say? We have to key the word that unlocks the meaning. Let's take a simple sentence. We're going to get personal here, Brom. <laughs> All right. I love you. I love Percy. you. Imagine if I keyed the first word. I. I. So if I say this sentence by keying, by emphasizing the first word, then it's I love you. I love you. Now, I can just yell it at you, but there's not a whole lot of meaning there, is it? You don't get much meaning from yelling. That's probably why I never understood my mother-in-law. No. Uh, so here's the deal. You want to find the meaning in there. I love you. Henry, take a stab at it. What do I mean by that? I love you. Henry, I don't know if you gave us an answer, but you're muted. Uh, everyone is muted in this meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Oh, man. Henry, sorry. This was your opportunity. If, if you wish, we can bring him on. on and, and yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. I love you. Meaning me, not him or her. Yeah? I love you. She doesn't love you. I love you. She just wants you for your car. I love you love you now watch what happens if i change the key word if i key you instead i love you i love you it changes the meaning of the line i don't have to emphasize every single word i simply decide what's the key word what's the word i need to emphasize You've got yourself a speech. In Toastmasters, it's your traditional five to seven. In real life, you may have to go up there and speak for 20 minutes or even 50 minutes or longer. How do you make sure that your audience is understanding your point? How do you make sure they're understanding your point? And you may need to repeat a line, by the way. There's nothing wrong with repeating a line. We forget that. You can repeat it, especially if it's important. We can repeat it, especially if it's important. Henry, do you ever get that feeling of deja vu? Do you ever get that feeling of deja vu? All right. So I love you. And then, of course, you go for the middle one. I love you. This is a simple sentence. I just wanted to make a point. I don't know how many of us are ever going to say I love you at a boardroom, but it's the idea that certain words are emphasized with a certain tone, a certain tone that communicates the meaning that you want, and it's precise, like a laser. You cannot emphasize every single word in a sentence. You cannot emphasize every single word in a speech. But if you pick your spots and focus in on them, that's how you make sure that your point is crystal clear to your audience. We all remember this. Today I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. If I key resonant, today I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice or what happens if i stress this one today 
I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. If you try to hit two keywords, today I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. Oh, that's getting strange and hard. And I ran out of breath, Furzy. It's like I went to Tibet and just didn't get enough oxygen. So what are you going to do? You got to take more breaths. Breathing counts. Breathing counts. Where you breathe matters. Those of you who sing, you understand this. You have to be precise about where you decide to breathe. When we're keying words and you're not sure exactly how to make sure that your audience understands the line, you have to watch where you breathe. Take a look at this. If I want to key to the word today and key the word resonant, then I have to take a breath. Today, breathe in. I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. Or a pause in a breath. Whoa, what? Furzy, hang on, back up. What? Two slashes is a breath. One slash is a pause. Furzy, what's the difference between a pause and a breath? Very simple. On the pause, you pause, and on a breath, you breathe. Yeah, but how long is the breath? It's not a matter of length. It's a matter of getting energy. That's a breath. When you breathe, well, you can't see that, can you? The sign's in my way. When you breathe, you're breathing in, usually through your nose, very quickly. Enough with the shenanigans. Today, breathe. I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. When you breathe, you have enough fuel to key your words. How many am I allowed, Furzy? You're allowed. Here we go, Henry. I know you're taking notes, man. I see you. I see you taking notes. You're allowed one key word per breath. I'm still trying to tell whether Sandra's writing it down or typing. I think she's typing. Very good. Oh, mm, yes. There you go, Sweeta. Yes. One key word per breath. That's all you're allowed. That's all you're allowed, gentlemen. One key word per breath. You want more keywords? Go get more breaths. How many breaths am I allowed, Verzi? As many as you want without hyperventilating and passing out on stage. That's embarrassing. In this case, I have a pause and a breath. You're allowed one. <laughs> you want to get really technical. <laughs> You're smart groups. So I'm going to get technical. You can always contact me later on if you need clarification. You're allowed one key word per breath. That's a primary key word. You're allowed one primary key word per breath. And then for each pause, you're allowed a secondary key word. What? Yes, there's actually tertiary keywords as well. You have a primary keyword, a secondary keyword, and a tertiary keyword. Not all your sentences are going to be long enough to need that. But every once in a while, you need to understand which is keyword is your primary and which keyword is the secondary so that you know that this one supports this one. That's how you construct meaning in a line. What? You need to have meaning in a line? Yeah. You have to have meaning in what you say to make it clear. Oftentimes, when we speak naturally, it comes out about right. But when we are speaking in front of an audience and we're trying to maximize that opportunity, then you have to be precise, especially if you're trying to be funny. If you're trying to be funny, then you can't just have a funny face. You have to have the ability to key a line to make it fun. By the way, Ram, I'm going to go back to this for just a second because I think you're the only one who can unmute. 
Brahm, I'd like to ask, I'd like for you to ask me a question. Would you please ask me what's the most important thing about comedy? Percy, what's the most important thing? Timing. About Timing. <laughs> Come on, man. That was funny. <laughs> That's impromptu. <laughs> All right, timing. Awesome. That's the other thing. You want to be funny? You want to be funny? You got to have impeccable timing. And it's harder on Zoom. <laughs> All right, moving forward. <laughs> Today, breathe. I will speak with a rich. Pause, round, these are secondary keywords. Yellows are secondary keywords. Pause, resonant, primary keyword. Take a breath. Voice. Try that on your own. I know you can't unmute, but go ahead and try that on your own. Today, resonant and voice are primary keywords. The greens are primary keywords. The double slashes are breaths. The single slashes are pauses. Would you go ahead and try that on your own, please? Okay, here's my go at it. Take a breath first. Today, breath. I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. Too many breaths? Probably. Probably. So how do we know how many breaths to take? Sandra, you're getting a headache because what I'm about to tell you is gonna just throw you for a looper. Fabiola, here we go. I'm gonna tell you the hardest thing to under, well, actually this was one of the hardest things to understand, but we're gonna take it to the next step, all right? We're gonna, bam, take it to the next step. Here we go. For those of you who want the master's degree in this stuff, there are four kinds of breathing. <laughs> There are four kinds of breathing. The first one is thought pattern. Thought pattern is when you breathe at the period. In the English language, we have sentences which are a complete thought marked by a period. That's why there's a little red dot there, the period. In the English language, different languages, different kinds of breathing and different kinds of speaking pattern. This one is Thought. We breathe at the period. When you breathe at the period, you are trying to create a thought. You're trying to create a thought, one complete thought. Sometimes we take a long sentence, those compound sentences, like our friend William Faulkner used to write. Oh, my gosh, those things were epic. And you breathe at the comma because they are phrases. What do we call that? Yes, you guessed it, phrasal. Phrasal is the second kind of breathing where we breathe at the phrase. We breathe at the phrase, not at the sentence. We breathe at the phrase, not at the sentence. This might be three, four, maybe even five words, and then you breathe. And then you finish the sentence because it's a compound sentence. By the way, when we're structuring our speeches, we should be aware of that. You don't want all your sentences the same way. You don't want every single one of your sentences to have the same exact number of words. You want to vary that up a little bit. Again, when the audience knows what you're up to, they will <clears throat> fall asleep on you. So you got to shift it up. Some sentences are this long, some sentences that long, some sentences are this long, and you punch it. How do you do this long and you punch it? Different kinds of breathing. Take a look at the third one. This is fragmented. Fragmented is the third one. This is when you might actually interrupt yourself. You actually interrupt. You fragment the sentence. You fragment the sentence. You divide it in the middle, sometimes even in the word. Take, for example, this example. Uh, take, for example, this sentence that we've been using. If I were to fragment it, it might be to they. I will speak with a rich, 
round, resonant voice. You fragment it. You might even divide up a long word. If you have a long word, you want to divide it up. It rarely happens. It doesn't happen a lot. But if you really wanted to make an impact on a very specific word, you do that. And then other times, this is called enjambment. The last one is called enjambment before we have to end for the day. The enjambment is when you jam several sentences together. Think about a story. When you're telling a story and you're trying to sort of get through the details to get to the end, you can enjam those words together, even though there's a period and another period, you can jam all that together so that you can get to the main point and you key the last word. Question from AJ Heron. Yes, sir. Is fragment breathing also a comma? It can land on a comma, but sometimes you're going to land in the middle of a word. You can break it up in the middle of a word. Think of somebody who is a little panicked or a lot panicked. Or, okay, can I, can I, can I say something here? And, and I hope you don't think badly of me of this, but, you know, we rehearse our speeches a lot. You go to contest, you're saying that thing a hundred million thousand times. How do you make it not sound boring? You, you got to have a little spontaneity, don't you? But how are you supposed to have spontaneity when you, when, when you've been saying it a hundred, a hundred million times? What do you do? You create a pause in the middle of a word. You fragment it. You fragment right in the, right in the middle, right in the middle of a word, and it makes it sound like you just thought of it. It makes it sound so incredibly spontaneous. And all you did was breathe a couple extra times. Question. Mm -hmm. Is there an easier way to remember those four types of breathing? That's I'm frank out my fragmentation as well. But that's the question is from Thim. Is there an easier way to remember these four types of breathing? I don't think so. There may be, but it's only four. Come on, man. You can do theme, write it. Write it down, theme, and practice it. Yeah, theme. Write it down, man. Come on, man. Sentence, phrasal, fragmentation, and jamming. In typical speeches, we tend to use just the first two, typically. Mm. Third and the fourth are when you start to get a little bit more pizzazz when you want to put a little pizzazz into what you're speaking but for the most part the first two are what you want the key thing to think about there is are you trying to have more keywords or fewer keywords there's there's a comment by aisha singh and she says sometime sometimes to attach an emotion to a word for example a sad moment maybe demonstrating that you were crying you could use the fragmentation in to convey certain types of emotions. That's what you're saying, right? Bingo. That? Bingo. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, forgot we it. Have right. a winner. Aisha, that means you win the free bowl of soup. <laughs> now, Kevin Rubia, does the camera matter? Laptop, phone, what sort of camera would work? What are you using? So Kevin has been asking this question several times. Not relevant to exactly what you're saying right now, but... <laughs> I use my typical Mac laptop. I, I know everybody's got different ways to do it. And, yeah. and I think you should choose the one that best suits you. I tried many different things. I found just as much success using my built-in microphone and my built-in camera. <clears throat> the thing to really think about is your lighting if you're online if you're doing it online and, and we can go back and forth with online and live but if you're online where you really want to invest some money is your lighting that's what's really going to give you some bang for the buck very inexpensive and the angles of your light make all the difference in the world 
All right, let's carry on. That's all I've got, Brom. That's where we're at. I b believe we have. Oh, about we were left. we were towards the end of the time, anyways. We are, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so that was perfect. You know what? This one hour and fifteen minutes or so passed by so quickly. It's just incredible. I, I thought that we could go on for a couple of hours as well. What I'd like to do is uh, for the audience here, yeah, we'll we'll do a future uh, mm -hmm. workshop with Furzi again. Say say in a few weeks' time when Furzi is available. I mean, he's in China, so the, the the thing is the timing difference is always the thing. And if he's agreeable, maybe he can get up at midnight and do one of these. So that's uh, much better for some of the people on this side of the world. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we will do. Uh, any last uh, bits of questions here? Uh, for for Furzi before we stop this uh, broadcast. By the way, there's a, a guest book. We would love your comments, your feedback, and how we did. My team, we, we have quite a number of people in this team that they love feedback. They thrive on it, and they can improve on that feedback. So please, the guest book as well. And uh, Furzi, do you have any uh, links or whatever they, they can uh, contact you? If you can put that in the chat, Furzi, so that they can contact you if they want to, want to do that. Will do. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the attention and I appreciate, not the attention, but I appreciate your attention and, and thank you. Nobody uh, threw Sandra, we have a few more minutes. If you want, put your question in the chat. I may have missed it. Sorry about that. Can you please uh, put your question back there? Send it directly to me so I, I can catch it. And, and for do you, do you coach speakers currently and... Uh, uh, for, for the contest go, going on right now are you doing that i've got several people that i've been coaching and and helping All out right. and uh, wish so everybody if, if anybody in the audience wants coaching you you are you you could do that right i mean sure it's not free i'm sure for the audience there if, if they want to know it's, it's of course uh, whatever that is you can discuss that with Furzi. his email is in there so send him send him an email and ask him what he charges and if you want to go to the world champion You'll be working well. You'll be competing with him. I think you are on your way there, right? Aren't you, Furzy? <laughs> One step at a time, moving on the journey. <laughs> All right. So Sandra's question is this. I want to know what you have for a background. So often in leadership speak, we, we keep losing body parts. Yours is really solid. What is that? So it's about virtual background or green screen or whatever. That's Sandra's question. So it what are you using? curtain. Ooh. A black curtain. <laughs> so, so, so you, so he's not using a virtual background, Sandra. He's using just a black curtain, and there you go. Makes my ball uh, stand out, doesn't it? In contests like at the international level, what sort of background do you use? It's not a curtain, is it? It's same. A, it's a different color curtain, or is it still the black curtain? Yes, sir. Same black curtain. All right, so there you go, guys. No virtual background, a curtain of your choice, if you wish. Or if you have a green screen like I do, I have a green screen. And, and then the, the color, the black that you see behind me is really a slide. Uh, so that's what I use. And uh, I use a, a program called mm -hmm. So you know, I can change things around quite a bit right, like that and so on and so forth. All right. And uh, yes, somebody wanted to know what sort of software you're using. I think you're using Prezi. Yep, Prezi video. All right. Easy, easy to use. And it, it is really it comes with uh, Zoom if you sort of subscribe yeah. to it, right? It, then you can get yeah. it. For me, it was a bit tricky. I had to um, erase it from my computer. It was uh, bothering my setup here, so I had to take it off. But I used mm -hmm, anyways. So, but it, Prezi is more sophisticated. Is there a cost attached to Prezi? It does cost a little bit if you want the uh, annual. Fairly low price, manageable. Good. Andrew Byrne says uh, he uses mm -hmm Studio as well. Perfect. Yes, Andrew, I I love mm -hmm Studio. Well, it's called mm -hmm. for those of you who are wondering why is it doing. Mm -hmm? <laughs> I'm humming. <laughs> no, <laughs> they call it mm -hmm. and so if you read Andrew's uh, uh, comment, there, that's exactly what it's called. All right, last minute questions there from uh, anybody. Um, I will unmute everyone so you can. Uh, uh, chat uh the formal part of this meeting is over so thank you very much all for coming and thank you Furzi, for being here with us uh thank you for being um 
uh, so generous with your time to serve uh, us at, at no cost at all and just being there. And I know it's very late at night for you. What, what is it, 10, 20 or something at night for you, not right now? Precisely. So thank you so much for, for being here, for serving. Much appreciated. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it, everyone. Love you, Mercy. Oh, I, I love I, I you. Can get a date. <laughs> Bossy, thanks, Bossy. You. you are such a great Jeffers. moderator and speaker. Thanks. Thank you. God bless you. So, Versi, can you <clears throat> can you do an example of that last element of breathing for me? The enjambment. Sure. sure. I kept on asking for it, but it, it wasn't coming up in the chat. The, uh, the example I would use would be the same phrase. It would be, today I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice. Today I will speak with a rich, round, resonant voice, where you're jamming into sentence ahead of time. If you're familiar with the actor John Malkovich, he likes to do that. He likes to jam. He takes a breath in the middle of the next sentence. He doesn't take a breath where you should. He jams the next sentence into the first sentence and breathes somewhere down the line. So it catches you off guard. When we catch our audience off guard, it sort of jolts them awake and pulls them in. Very subtle, but it's, it's, it's an easy way to make sure that you have your audience with you. Just like that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question, AJ.